Okay guys, so let's look at these extras now, starting with the incredible undo history. Um, I've got this project with the single drum loop. I've selected the channel for the drum loop there. Okay. Now, if I hold down the shift, find adjust button, uh, that then accesses any menu buttons. Some of these buttons function as menus as well. The first five here are menu items. So shift and history. And then the on-screen display dulls down to this kind of Pantone, very warm grey colour. And at the top it says history with a timestamp in hours, minutes and seconds. And it says step zero. And step zero is the current step that you're at, the last thing you did to the selected channel. Okay, And then using the volume control I can step back and back and back and back through the entire history of every tweak I made to the selected channel. It, it's just incredible. Really fantastic. Back, 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 back. And this, this records for hours and hours and hours if your project lasts that long while it's open. So I scroll back, back. This is all the stuff I did to the channel as I was showing you the channel features. Back, 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 right back to the beginning. So that's how the channel was at the beginning. Okay, then I step forward one step. Oh, and that's where I reset the channel by loading the default preset to set it to everything off. And then stepping forward from there, look, you can see there, look, I set the input gain to minus 2 dB. And then stepping forward, I, I showed you the low cut and the high cut, and then we compared the, the roll off for each of those. And then stepping through, showing you the gate and um, the transient shaper. And then stepping forward, all the features of the EQ section forward 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 and then we looked at the compressor all the tweaks I made to the compressor then the final output section with the drive and all that up to step zero the last point at which I tweak the channel this is just amazing and what we're looking at here is the undo history for one channel every single instance of console one in your project records its own unique undo history it, it's just incredible. And that recording of the undo history per channel begins from the point you open the project. If you open a project that has instances of console one installed into the channels, you're opening a project to continue working on it. From the point you open the, the project, every instance of console one inserted into every channel in your mix begins recording its own un, undo history. And it will keep recording for even if you work on that project for 24 hours. And then It'll keep recording its history until the point you close the project. Or an individual plugin will, uh, instance of console one, will begin recording its own unique undo history from the moment you install it into a channel during a session. It, it's just unbelievable. You can step back and back and back in time to any point, any point. You know, <laughs> it's just brilliant. And then go, right, that's how I want my channel to be, as it was an hour ago or something. And you press okay and it set the channel like that but unlike a regular undo on a host sequencer that doesn't set every channel to that point in time back in history we've just set the one channel to that point in its own history every other channel is still at whatever setting it was at at the point we're at now in time it's amazing also if you reset a channel to a point in its undo history you haven't lost its history you go back into history and the entire history is still there. <laughs> it's just brilliant. <laughs> so if I scroll right forward to the point I reset the history and step back one step, that's how the channel was before I reset it to a previous point in history. Boom, OK. This is just amazing. Every channel, every instance of console one records its own history. And the reason this is so brilliant is that sequences, Logic, Pro Tools, Cubase, etc., they don't record the history for the movement of parameters for things like EQ, compressors, gates, and, and other plugins. None of that gets recorded. Uh, this is just a stroke of genius, this, this undo history. It's absolutely brilliant. Sure, that's the undo history. Next, um, using the filters to compress a switch, you can switch the low and high cut filter into the sidechain circuit of the compressor. And when you do that, this sidechain filters lights up here on the on-screen display for the compressor section. Okay, now if you're, you're new to this game, but you're thinking of buying this product, I'll just explain what that means. 
The side chain circuit of the compressor is the circuit that the compressor uses to listen to the signal passing through the channel to see if it's too loud. And if it's too loud, it tells the processing part of the compressor circuit to turn the level down. So now these two filters, the high and low cut, are switched into that listening circuit for the uh, as the compressor listens to the, the the material passing through. In this case, the drum loop. Now, once you switch the filters into the side chain of the compressor, if you move them, you don't see their curves on the EQ display here anymore. Okay. So look, the compressor is listening to this drum loop, and if I turn up the low cut, you, you can't see it on the display here, but you can see its amount being turned up there. Okay, I'll bring it right up as high as it will go to 6k. Right. So now, the sidechain circuit of the compressor listening to the drum loop passing through this channel, it can only hear frequencies of that drum loop from 6k upwards. So it can't hear any bottom end frequencies of the drum loop. So if I put some heavy compression on, right. Okay, the compressor, it's it's ignoring the bass frequencies. It can't hear things from 6,000 hertz downwards. So it's not really compressing the kick anymore. Yeah, it's just compressing, let's just drop the attack a bit. It's, it's just compressing the more high end stuff, the smack, the high end smack of the snare and the toms and the cymbals and stuff. But if I roll this low cut filter off, as I roll it down, you'll hear that the, the kick drum, the, bot the bottom end stuff, starts to become compressed. Because as I roll this low cut off, the compressor starts to hear those bottom end frequencies. Right, hear that? And now hear, hear, how that, hear how that kick drum is really being flattened, like that. Yeah, the kick drum is now just going thwack, thwack, you know, it's being flattened, crushed. Bring the low cut up, higher and higher, and then the compressor can't hear that kick frequencies anymore, it starts to not compress it. Right, and it's the same in reverse with the high cut. If I roll the high cut completely down, to 100 hertz, now the side chain of the compressor can only hear frequencies of 100 hertz and below, so it's compressing the kick with all the bottom end, because it's only listening to the bottom end of the drum loop. So it, it hears the bottom end, it hears the kick, and it compresses the kick, but all the high end stuff, all the mid and high end stuff, it, it doesn't compress it. So you hear that com the kick is being pack, 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 flattened, but the stuff up the top isn't being compressed. Yeah. Very, very, very cool, this. And you know, like, if I bring the low cut up to 6K, 6,000 hertz, and then the high cut to 7K, now the side chain of the compressor can only hear frequencies in this drum loop between 6 and 7K, just in that very narrow band. So it'll only compress frequencies that it hears going over threshold in that band between 6 and 7K. Everything below and above, it'll, it, it can't hear it. So you can use the high and low cut to force the compressor to zone in and listen to certain frequencies and, and react only to those frequencies in the material passing through the channel. Which, if you think about it, vastly um, increases the things you can do with the compressor. You can tweak the compressor to zone in on certain frequencies in the material passing through the channel and, and compress those more than others. It's really, really cool, this. Um, yeah. So that's the filters. Let's roll those back. So that's the filters to the side chain of the compressor. Okay now the side chain circuit of the compressor and the shaper gate section can take an external signal. And I'll just explain that again for people who uh, may be thinking of buying this but are not uh, very, very advanced in, in sound recording. Um, so here I've got a project, there's a synth. Playing a really simple lead pattern. Okay, and um, here's its channel in the mixer. Okay, and then let me just mute that. And then we've got a drum box here. And the drum box is playing a 16th rim shot. Okay, now this is the drum box channel, and the output for this channel is being routed to this group bus. So the signal from this rim shot on this drum box here 
goes to this group boss and then from the group boss to the final output so we can hear it. So if I mute the group bus, the signal from the rim shot is still getting into this group bus, but it can't get out of the group bus to the final output, so we don't hear it anymore. But it's still getting into the group bus. And the group bus is bus one. Okay, so the, the rim shot's getting into this group bus, bus one. Now we go to the synth channel here, and it's got an instance of console one on. We open that, the plugin wrapper for that, and you can choose the side chain. Um, four plugins on the host wrapper in Cubase, Logic, etc. So here we go to the side chain and we choose that bus one, right? Okay. Which is the rim shot sound. Okay. Bring up the old screen display. I've only got two channels here. We've got um, this drum loop, and um, which we're not using, and we've got the lead synth. So I choose the lead synth channel. Okay. So. Here, external sidechain. I switch the external sidechain for this channel to compressor. And now the sidechain of the compressor is going to hear that 16th rim shot coming in, and that will trigger the compressor. Okay, The sound going through the compressor is the synth. So if I add compression, the 16th rim shot starts ducking the compression up and down, making it go on off, on off, on off like that, which makes the synth go up and down in level, because the compressor is making it go up and down. Yeah, and so we get um, we get a sort of tremolo effect on on that synth. When you switch external sidechain to the compressor, then the external sidechain lights up here on the on-screen display for the compressor section. Again, okay, now let's let's switch that sixteenth rim shot um, into the sidechain of the shaper and gate section. Boom! All right, let's take the compression down a bit. Okay, so now if I bring up the gate, the the sidechain of gate is listening to that sixteenth rim shot, and that triggers the gate. So the gate's been open closed, open closed, open closed by the 16th rim shot coming into the side chain, and the synth passing through the gate is getting turned on, off, on, off, on, off. And there's your classic. If you put it into hard gate, there's your classic trance gating effect. And by the way, when you're working on all sorts of material, like say this, the the punch, you know, the dynamics here, the punch and the sustain, you, you can you can use that to modify the sound still. this. Okay, so that's um, external signal to the side chain of the compressor and the gate shaper section, and then off. All right. Okay, here's a little project. There's four vocals. Yay! Um, here we've got these all and group button. Now if I hold down group, let's bring up the on-screen display. Okay, we choose a channel. I've got four vocals here, vocal one, two, three, and four. Okay, then I've got a group bus and my final output. So I choose one of the vocals, vocal two, let's say, right? And then I hold down the group button. Now this is not latching. I hold down group, and then I can bring in any other channels I want in that group. So I'll bring in those three vocals and then let go. Now those three vocals are now in a group. And if I do anything, it's going to affect all the channels in the group. So I'll roll up the low cut like that and add a low cut to the three channels in the group. That's done. Now just select any of the group channels individually and it takes them out of group. And now if you look at the three channels, they've all got that low cut on. Yeah. Okay, put them, hold down group again, put them back into a group and roll that low cut off like that. Come out of group, now they haven't got the low cut. Okay, so that's really cool, the group, to do a tweak to a group of channels together, the same. But we've also got the same thing for all. Again, it's non-latching. If I hold down the All button here, every instance of Console 1 on every channel in my mix is selected. And then I can do a tweak, and it will affect every channel. That could be really cool. Like Some people like to begin a session by adding a low cut to every single channel. And you can do it easily by just holding down all, add your low cut, every channel, every instance of console one has got that low cut on it then. So they're really cool. Okay guys, so I said I'd explain the solo safe. Um, and again, this is for less experienced users who might be thinking of buying this product. 
So here I've got that um, vocal mix with the four vocals in, but I've just added a few extra instruments, so there's a few other things going on. Yeah. Okay. Now the way it's set, and this is how you use console one, it works like this. Everything in the mix, right? All individual channels, whether it's vocals, guitars, basses, whatever, and any instrument channels, synths, whatever, every individual channel in your mix, you put an instance of console one on it, and all those instances, they're not set to solo safe. Right? So if you solo any individual channel, the others all mute. Yeah, yeah. Right? Now, everything in the mix is routed to this final stereo output. It has an instance of console one set to solo safe. So if I solo any individual channel, all the other individual channels mute and the solo channel is allowed to pass through the master out because it's solo safe, it doesn't mute. And we hear that individual channel pass through the master out to our monitors. But the four vocals, they're not rooted to the final master out, they're rooted to a group bus altogether. They go to this group bus first. Yeah. Yeah. As a group, then from the group bus, they go to the final master out. So the group bus, its instance of console one is also set to solo safe. So if I solo an individual vocal, yeah. it passes yeah. to the group bus, which is solo safe, so the, the solo vocal is allowed to pass through that group bus and then to the master out, which is solo safe, so the signal is allowed to pass through the master out into the monitors and we hear it. Everything else, including the other vocals, all mute, and we hear that soloed vocal. Pass through the group bus, solo safe, through the master out, solo safe, and to the monitors. Yeah! Right, okay. But if you want to solo the group bus, if you choose it on console one and solo it, it solos, but everything else in the mix mutes as it should, so we have the group bus solo but all the vocals rooted to it mute and we don't hear them at the group bus. So the only way to solo and listen to a group bus while you tweak it in console one is you choose the group bus channel on the host sequencer and solo it there. Now uh, all the channels in the host sequencer they know what is rooted to what. So when I solo the group bus channel on the host sequencer it knows the four vocals are rooted to it, so it lets them stay open, but it mutes everything else in the mix. And so we hear the four vocals soloed on this soloed group channel. Yeah, yeah. Then we choose the equivalent channel on console one, and we tweak that console one instance as we listen to the solo channel soloed on the host sequencer equivalent channel. Yeah, now I can tweak this, yeah. do what I like to it, you know. Yeah, and that's that's how it works. All right, all instances of console one should be set not to solo safe, but any instances on group buses or on the master output or on auxiliary returns should be set to solo safe. All right, and then when you solo something rooted to a group bus, it doesn't mute and it's allowed to pass through to the master output, which also doesn't mute, so you hear it. All right. And that is how solo safe works, okay? All right. Okay, so the menu stuff. Um, let's start with the display. Um, the on-screen display, you know, I like to bring it in and out manually with the display on off button. Bring it in, choose the channel I want, tweak it and close it. But you can set it to auto with the auto button here, all right? So if I set this to auto, the light lights up above auto and then after the default four seconds, the on-screen display disappears. Bring it up with the on button, after the default, default four seconds, it disappears. Tweak a parameter, it pops up, after four seconds the default, it disappears. All right, let's just turn that auto off. But I can change that if I want. Um, we've got settings here, shift and this 20th button is settings. Shift settings, and in a menu use volume to go to the choose the menu item you want. I can go to the set auto display delay, go into that with the solo button which is okay in menus, 
there's the default four seconds. I can set the delay uh, for the on-screen display to anything from five minutes to 0.2 of a second. Okay. Um, the actual display itself has different modes. The first mode is, as you see it here, with this fast Fourier transform in the Q window. Okay. You can cycle around the views with Shift and the display on button. Right. So. Shift the second view is like that, exactly the same but without the fast Fourier transform in the EQ window. The third view is a pot view like that if you prefer that. The fourth view is a meter bridge and the fifth view is a reduced meter bridge and then you cycle back round to the main display with the fast Fourier transform again. All right, that's really cool. Um, and that fast Fourier transform you can adjust that as well. By default it shows the signal at input, but if you want with shift settings you can go to the fast Fourier transform menu, you can set the processing to show output instead, um, so it will show the fast Fourier transform after the EQ and everything. Um, you can change the block size of the fast Fourier transform, make it coarser or finer, by default it's 2048 blocks, you can make it coarser, 1024 blocks, you can make it finer at 4096 blocks. And the decay, that's how fast the fast Fourier transform display drops away when it's finished triggering. You know. um, the decay, you can change that from the default 10 dB a second to a faster 30 dB a second. Right, Cancel to come out of the menu. Okay, now across the top here with shift, apart from that, as I showed you already, shift history, just cancel out of that, we've got load. Okay, we can load a channel strip, that's loading the emulation into the plugin inserted in the channel. Um, now, if you had the 4000E and the 9000K emulations installed, then you could choose to load a 4000D emulation or a 9000K emulation into the console one plugin on the selected channel. Okay. Also, you've got you can load only the shaper from any installed emulation into the shaper section. You can load just the EQ from any installed emulation into the EQ section and you can load just the compressor from any installed channel strip emulation into the compressor section. So as I said at the end of the last bit, the beauty of this system is it's open-ended. There are currently two channel strips available, the 4000D and 9000K. Any console one instance on a channel can load either the 4000D or the 9000K. You can mix them, match them in projects. But within each overall emulation you load into an instance of console one on a channel, you can load the shaper, the EQ and the compressor section from any of those two emulations. So you can mix and match. You can have a 4000 E channel strip with a 9000K compressor. You can have a 9000K channel strip with the 4000 E compressor. You can mix and match the sections. And as I said, further classic channel strip emulations will be coming from console one to add to it. Okay. And you can also load up any individual plugins as well from Softube. So if you've got other compressor plugins, installed, they'll be available to choose from this menu here and you can load them into the compressor section. If you've got any other EQ emulations installed, they'll be available here to load as just an EQ into the EQ section, regardless of which overall channel strip is on that channel, on that instance of console one. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and then we've got the presets. You've got the preset button here preset and you can load a preset that's the settings for a channel or you can load a preset for just the compressor into the whatever the compressor you can load a preset for the equalizer or a preset for the shaper only and you've got user presets as well if I go into that you choose the channel strip you're loading a user preset for I only have the 4000e installed otherwise um, if I had the 9000k installed and I could um, load a preset for that. So I go into there and here are my custom subfolders. I've got a subfolder for drum presets and I've made one channel strip preset in there. And I've got another custom folder for vocals and I've got two channel strip presets in there that I created. So these folders here, they're custom you can create as many custom subfolders within the overall channel strip um, folder as you like. 
for your presets. Let's come out of that. So if we go into save preset, which is the same preset button with shift, but with shift, shift and preset, the current track settings will be saved as a preset. That's however you've got the, the track, the channel set, you're going to be saving that as a preset. So you go OK, and this drops down from above. Now I am saving the settings for this channel and this channel has a 4000D emulation installed. Okay, so it takes me to the 4000D master folder. If I was saving a preset I'd created on a 9000K emulation channel, it would take me to the 9000K folder. And then inside that, you can see the custom folders I created. I can choose to save my preset, which I title here, into either of these custom folders. But I can create a new folder if I want, as many as I like. Um, and you can create custom folders for drum presets, vocal presets, guitar presets, bass presets, bus presets, whatever. Fantastic. So title it, put it in the folder you want, save. Boom. Yeah. Oh yeah, one last thing. If you don't want to go through the whole business of saving um, the settings for a channel using the console one dialog, then what you can do is you can just save it like you'd save the setting for any um, plugin that comes with your host sequencer. Just open the console one plugin wrapper in your host sequencer and you can save the preset here. You know, just like you would any plugin that comes with your host sequencer. So I'll just come here and I do save as and it takes me to the console one plugin um, as an installed plugin, you know. And I call this rock drum fill toms or whatever um, save and then it's available here as a preset you know. and then you know you can save stuff quickly here while you're working and then afterwards you can come here and load up those presets and um, then save them you know to the console one save system if you want to do that okay so that's just that little extra there so it's really comprehensive for loading and saving presets and this fantastic ability to mix and match overall channel strip emulations within a project and then mix and match the individual sections of those available channel strip emulations within any channel strip. It's really bloody clever, I'll tell you. And the very last thing is the writing of track automation. These, these controls write track automation. Now the on-screen display must be open for this to happen. But the good news, of course, is that you can cycle around with the display and set it to something like the meter bridge, and then you can still see what's going on in your project, but the on-screen display is open as it must be to write track automation. So let me just load up this other project there. Okay, so um, I'll write some automation for this fourth vocal here. All right, so I choose that fourth vocal with the on the console one. Uh, now, all the pots write automation, but these are not touch sensitive. Um, so let me put track automation on. So if you're going to write automation, don't choose touch, you choose latch or write. And by the way, this is not a general purpose controller. You can't use this to write automation for your synths and things like that. It only controls console one. Okay, so I'll put this into write and I'll just quickly I'll just quickly write some automation. I'll, I'll move this frequency control here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can write, let's undo that. You can write track automation um, from the hardware if you want. But of course, if you want to pencil stuff in, you just go to the, your track automation console one, choose the parameter and pencil it in manually, you know. Okay. So that's that. Um, the meter bridge, I hadn't mentioned it. Yeah. You know, stereo channels are in stereo, mono are in mono, and the, you have um, a gain reduction meter at the side of each channel for the gate and compressor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, there's one last thing. Yeah, sometimes, and this, I don't know if this happens on Windows, but on Mac, sometimes if you have the on screen display open, no matter what, state it's in what you know what view mode it's in sometimes if your mac goes to sleep when you come back and wake it up there'll be an error message in the middle here error 11 saying that the console one has crashed it will tell you to disconnect the hardware and restart console one 
or what you do is you disconnect the hardware and then at the top here you quit console one that closes the on-screen display then you reconnect the hardware you go to your applications where you'll find the console one app double click open it it'll appear back up here again and then you can use it again from there okay just a little crash it does i don't know whether they'll fix that but it doesn't cause a problem it's a matter of 30 seconds 20 seconds to get it back up and running again yeah um, i haven't noticed it doing that crash if i close the on-screen display before the mac goes to sleep and i don't know if that happens on windows all right well, that's everything it's 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 fantastic i said at the end of the last bit i'll give it 10 out of 10. again what are your options for SSL? Authorised emulations, I don't think there's any others. There's just the UAD one, which requires the hardware acceleration. There's the Waves one, which is a native plugin, but neither of those have the hardware controller, which is just so great to get, you know, to get away from the mouse, as I said before, really. You know, as I said, you, you can stand in the room, listening to the mix, step forward, choose a channel, tweak a parameter, step back, listen. You you get away from that thing of being hunched over the desk, fiddling with the mouse all the time. You know, you can stand up, move around the room, um, which is something, you know, all engineers do when they're working in studios. You don't just sit in front of the console, hunched over it all the time. You get up, you move around, you listen, and you step forward and make a little tweak, you listen, you know what I mean? It's, it's fantastic. The hardware is built like a tank. Um, it's on a special deal, um, as I said. And lastly, I'll just tell you, if you'd like to watch some uh, really cool video about the console one, have a look on Softube's YouTube channel and search for Softube meets SSL, and you'll find four videos there. Uh, one is about um, the history of SSL. Uh, the second one is about developing the console one project, project um, and product. The third video is about the Black Knob EQ and the fourth video is about the 9000K emulation. Very very interesting videos to watch. Uh, one of the guys participating is he's been with SSL since the year dot and he was one of the original service engineers that travelled all over the world. It's really interesting to hear them talking about how they developed the product and how they evaluated it to the point where they went yep yeah, that sounds like the 4000E, that sounds like the 9000K, boom stamp our name on it yeah so again yeah, a fantastic product i'll give it a 10 out of 10 and as i said i will be buying this and i hope that's been useful to you um and i'll see you for the next video whatever it is